Lisa Peter, who is here. Uh, she's a faculty um, associate professor at the University of Maryland, and she's on sabbatical. Uh, I guess this semester mostly at uh, San Jose Santa Cruz. And she does a lot of work with um, data mining, dealing with structured and unstructured data. It's the bio book more, and you go to her webpage, which links to the fish thing. And today she's going to talk about graph identification of privacy. Okay, so I think this, especially to this crowd, is like no news whatsoever. There's graphs and networks everywhere. Um, in particular, one of the largest uh, graphs around is the web. Um, but there's a lot of other kinds of data that can be thought of as um, graphs or networks. So there's social networks, communication networks, financial transaction networks, biological networks, and a lot of other ones. And as a matter of fact, you can go on the web and find these kind of nice visualizations of webs, or at least it looks kind of nicer on my laptop than it does up there. Uh, but this is a picture of the internet. Or you can find something like this, which is a food web, um, which describes different species and who eats who and who decomposes who and so on. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about these pictures is that actually there's a fair amount of work that goes involved in even constructing the pretty picture. So for example, to get this internet map, you have a bunch of trace route information. You need to line that up in order to get the graph. And in fact, we actually had a discussion over lunch about this in food webs. If you go and read this paper, there's a lot of work describing or figuring out what the right level of abstraction to model the web is and so on. So while we have a wealth of data, so we are inundated with data describing networks, a lot of the data is noisy, incomplete, and it's at the wrong level of abstraction for analysis. So what I'm going to describe in kind of the first part of the talk is the problem of that I call identification. So how do you take a bunch of incredibly noisy, incomplete information describing a network and then kind of consolidate it and abstract it in the right way to do something useful with it. But then there's kind of the flip side of, well, there's all this noisy data out there and you can join it together and you can get a lot of things that maybe you didn't want people to get. So there's this kind of privacy element too of, you know, how all this observational data that's out there for completely different reasons can now be kind of munched together and mashed up in certain ways so that you can get information that maybe you would prefer people not to get. And so I'm going to start off talking about identification. So um, there's a, a lot of real world data sets that are inherently relational. So there's social networks, biological networks, communication networks, citation networks, but then there's also the kinds of networks that I imagine you guys deal with, which is you have query logs and you have relationships between the uh, query logs and the quick click logs and um, uh, all that kind of behavior as well. Um, however, in many cases, the observations are noisy and graph identification is a problem of trying to infer the correct graph that you then want to do your science on from this kind of what I'm calling a data graph. And as an example, um, so trying to infer, say, a organization hierarchy where you can figure out, for example, in the Enron email collection, you know, who the crooks are, you know, how they're connected and things. But what you're trying to get it from is from, you know, the email. And the email is a graph that describes, you know, who emailed who and so on, um, but it doesn't necessarily have the mapping from, say, the email address to the individuals and their position in the hierarchy, and you're trying to 
infer this kind of organizational hierarchy or social network from the communication patterns. Um, another one is, you know, in biological data, you may be interested in actually being able to figure out um, the uh, which proteins interact, but from you're doing this from incredibly noisy, you know, high throughput um, uh, gene array data and so on. Uh, another quick example is, you know, internet security, where what you're trying to get out is a real um, understanding of the network and understanding of, you know, which um, of the hosts are uh, benign versus which ones are um, compromised, and in reality, the data that you have is not kind of at the right level necessarily to um, infer that. So the solution is to kind of take this noisy data and try and infer the information graph. And the key thing is that the dependencies are hopefully in the data, in the nodes and the edges and so on, such that we can make use of that and exploit it to get out the graph that we're really interested in. And the nice thing is usually that information graph is going to be much smaller than the original observational graph. You'll have this huge observational graph that you're trying to compress into the kind of graph that really has what you want in it. So I'm going to go through kind of some of the processes that kind of inference processes that are required for doing um, graph identification, and one of the simplest ones is, okay, you have a network, and in that network, you may have some of the nodes labeled, and here I'm just showing, you know, green labels and orange labels, and what I want to do is I want to get out a fully labeled graph, so I want to infer the labels of the un, um, unlabeled nodes. And I want to do that in a way that obviously makes use of the information in the things that something's connected to. So if green is spam and orange is, you know, advertising or something like that, I'm trying to figure out what the classify the different pages. Well, it may be the case that you know, spam pages usually link to other spam pages, or it may be that there's other kinds of correlations that you can make use of. So one of the most basic kinds of inferences that you want to do is this kind of just label the nodes. And for, so it's a classification problem, but it's a classification problem in networks. Um, another kind of uh, inference task is predicting the existence of links. So um, it may well be the case that you have a lot of observed, say, communication links, and what you're trying to do is infer another kind of link, a relationship like so-and-so works for so-and-so, um, so so-and-so is the boss of someone, and so on. So it's from one kind of observed link, I'm going to infer another kind of semantic link. But again, it's a prediction problem, but it's a hard prediction problem. And part of the reason it's a hard prediction problem is because just the kind of prior probability of any edge is just going to be so low that you oftentimes have a lot of difficulty in being able to do these um, accurately. Um, another aspect is in the data graph, in many cases, you'll have multiple representations for an entity. And so you have to do a step of entity resolution, which is actually merging the nodes. Um, and I'm actually going to go into a little bit more detail about the algorithms for doing this um, in a minute once I go over a high-level overview of the different problems. Um, and then the last one that I'm going to mention is group detection or community detection. So finding clusters of nodes in graphs. So these are really kind of basic inference problems that are useful. So uh, doing collective classification, doing link prediction, doing entity resolution, and doing the group detection. 
And ideally what you want is you want to combine all of these inferences together. You don't want to do each in isolation. You want to group them together in order to get out the graph that you want to use. Um, whether this is a query graph where you've aggregated a bunch of queries together or um, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, graphs. So as I said, I want to go through one of these in a little bit more detail, which is um, entity resolution. If anybody wants to hear more about the other problems, I'm happy to talk about them. But um, entity resolution is one of the things that my group has done a lot of work with. And in particular, we've done it in the context of graphs and networks. So how do you make use of the graph information to help you do the resolution? Um, and just as an example, uh, what I'm showing right now is a teeny tiny fragment of a co-author network. So the nodes are authors and the links between the nodes are that they co-authored a paper together. And this is from a real data set that was used in the 2004 InfoViz contest. And actually, they had done a lot of work hand cleaning the data. So there's not supposed to be any errors in the data. But if you look at the data carefully, and go through the process of figuring out exactly you know, which of those references are in fact referring to the same, you get on one side what you had before was kind of a big kind of spaghetti mess. And then after doing the resolution, you have this nice tight clique of co-authors. And so I want to emphasize the importance of doing this entity resolution step before you do any other algorithms on your data. Because if you applied any of the standard you know, social network measures or anything like that on the original data set, you get completely bogus results. So the centrality is wrong, the betweenness is wrong, you know, all of these things are wrong. So it's incredibly important to do this before um, doing any other network analysis. Yeah, Peter. Yes, and so um, it's it's a. If you repeat the question to the folks, the studio audience. Um, so what uh, Peter asked was, you know, can't you use the network measures to help you do this resolution process? And actually, that's very much the flavor of what we're going to do is try and um, have an inference process that makes use of network structure to help correct the resolutions, but yeah. Um, and so typically, the entity resolution can be thought of as kind of a clustering problem where you have, say, a database of references where you have these strings. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to cluster them together to find out the kind of hidden underlying entities. and there's an identification problem, which is to map all of these strings to the same individual. And then there's a disambiguation problem of figuring out that, OK, J. Smith in one context refers to this guy, and in another context refers to this guy. And um, traditionally, it's been set up as a pairwise classification problem, where basically you take one reference, say this um, James Smith reference, and you do the cross product of it with all of the other references in the database. And you can clearly see the problem. So first off, if you're going to have this um, kind of setup, you're going to need to pick a threshold. Once you pick a threshold, there's a precision recall trade-off in how you do that. Um, but in this example for James Smith, in one case, when I compare it to J. Smith, I want to say, yes, they're the same. And in another case, I want to say, no, they're different. And clearly, given the information that I've shown here, there's an inability to disambiguate. And then. When people do this as a pairwise classification problem, typically 
Then there's this notion, well, do you do transitive closure afterwards or not? And as I'll show in some results, sometimes that's the right thing to do, sometimes that's not the right thing to do, so it's not obvious. Um, so what we're going to look at is relational entity resolution, and this is exactly, you know, let's use the network structure to help us. And the network structure comes in because things occur together. And so we want to use the relations to help improve identification and disambiguation. And, you know, there's a whole host of people working um, in this area. And so um, this is something that people are very interested in, you know, in doing information extraction and needing to do this kind of entity resolution. How can you make use of structure? But let me first um, try and motivate uh, with the original example. In this picture, what I'm showing is I'm showing two of the Heisu references. And the square nodes, I'm trying to decide, do these refer to the same underlying entity or do they refer to different ones? And in this case, what I've done is I've shown the shared co-authors in the center and the non-shared co-authors on the side. And in this case, they do in fact refer to the same underlying individual. They do have two co-authors in common, so I can resolve them. Here's another case where the um, kind of similarity between the names is exactly the same, but they have no shared co-authors. So in this case, it turns out to be a case where they're actually distinct. And Fernando? Right. You, the, the Spence uh, uh, right, has not been tweeted, the other one has not been identified yet. Right. So, so you are allowing yourself some slack there in, in saying, oh, I'm going to merge that, even though their full co authorship, but like, they are not exactly the same set of quarters yet. Anyway. Right. Right. So, definitely, it's looking at the similarity of the co authors, it doesn't have to be an exact match and figuring out how to do that in the right way is kind of the focus of the inference algorithms. So, so just kind of a follow up on that question. The, so, the, so you're not at this point doing some kind of transitive uh, identification like you do, say, if you were doing uh, a, you know, automatic equivalence, right? You say, oh, those two nodes are the same because everybody, everything they go to either is the same or is equivalent as well once those are made equivalent. Right, so, so uh, sorry, the sorry, the, the question was, you know, in this setup, am I doing an exact match on the co-authors, and if I was, then I wouldn't be matching these because of the fact that they have non-shared co-authors, and am I doing, like, more of a transitive closure at this point when I'm... Um, would I then kind of merge a bunch of things? And at this point, I'm more kind of motivating the problem. The, and so at this point, it's looking at each decision as a pairwise decision. Um, are these the same or not? But that t leads perfectly into um, the point that I want to make on the next slide is that these things depend on each other. So. Um, in the case where I, for example, do decide that these two Elmendorf references are the same, maybe the um, name similarity is enough to make me decide that, then that's going to give me the additional evidence that would help me decide, oh, maybe I can merge the Singer references. So very much there's a question of how do you chain together the independent pairwise decisions in order to do a good job in the resolution. And um, so there's a couple algorithms, and I'll just talk about them kind of at a high level. So one of the ones, first ones, is a relational clustering algorithm. And the relational clustering algorithm is very simple. Um, you can kind of understand it as defining a similarity function that is a weighted combination of both just the object level similarity and then how do we capture the graph similarity. 
So some sort of measure of how similar the neighborhoods are, how similar the, in the running example, how similar the co-authors are. And this is a place where being smart about using the kind of network metrics and understanding what domain you're in for how you should um, do this similarity is important. Um, when we were doing it in the context of co-author networks, we looked at a variety of ways of comparing neighborhoods. And originally, we thought that doing like the right, the multi-set, kind of compare, do a matching of all the sets of co-authors and, you know, aggregate over that was the right thing to do. And, you know, first off, that's really expensive, doing a multi-set comparison like that. And then we found that if we just projected it onto a set and kept counts, that first off, it's hugely f more efficient, but also it didn't hurt us that much in terms of performance. Now, I think that that will vary depending on your domain, whether that's accurate, but uh, we were surprised how much having a simple uh, relational similarity metric actually um, ended up being fine. And then, you know, this is a basic algorithm, so it's basically a greedy clustering algorithm where we're going to merge the cluster of references that are going to have the biggest um, uh, impact on this objective function. Um, again, that's a, a simple setup. And then the algorithm, the key thing that's different from a vanilla um, greedy agglomerative clustering algorithm is, uh, first off, the first step there's no way for any real entity resolution problem that you want to actually compare all pairwise um, uh, references. So that's just not going to scale. So all these algorithms have some flavor of what's called blocking or use of canopies and so on to quickly put together references that maybe are going to be the same, and then distinguish references that there's no way they're going to be the same. And so there's some sort of uh, bucketing that goes on that kind of groups together the references so that you only compare entity resolution for um, those things that have been bucketed together. So this uh, is absolutely essential. And we used a kind of off-the-shelf method for doing this. I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done in, you know, how to do this the best way. And then the, um, the final difference is when you're doing the clustering, once you merge some collection of references, you actually have to be smart and update all the other references that co-occur with those. So you have to build a decent index structure that will allow you to easily get to those references and be able to update the similarities, and that's something that you want to have in. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, in your objective function, you had like W A and W R, and it sounds like you only allow yourself then to change the weight for the whole similarity measure. Assuming it's similarity over different attributes, different attributes may you want to give different weights to them, but that somehow. No. Will parameters for that, or how, how do you decide how to set the weights for different attributes? Or different so, so um, that is something that I'm like doing this at such a high level that it's not showing, but definitely you would have different weights for attributes. But as you said, it's still, as I've set this up here, a single weight vector for all of the references. And actually, it's very interesting to think about making that more adaptive. And we have some work that does make it more adaptive, but I'm just kind of presenting the most vanilla one. But it's certainly the case that this uh, is really kind of packing in a lot of things that the weight would be, uh, for example, in um, name references. You would take into account the names more strongly than you know, their height or something like that. But still, you want to make use of those. Um, okay. <laughs>
And then we also have another model, which I won't go over, but a kind of variant of LDA uh, applied for entity resolution. Um, and, but let me get to some experiments that we've done. So these are three different um, citation data sets, so they're co-author networks. The first one is a small data set, obviously, um, describing computer science papers, in particular machine learning papers. Uh, the second one, Archive, is a paper describing high energy physics data sets. And the third one is a larger data set describing a um, collection of uh, biology papers. Now in the first two, all we had was the author names, but in the third one, we actually had additional attributes, keywords, topic, language, and so on. And we made use of these in the relational clustering algorithm. And uh, the baselines that we compared to is we compared to an algorithm that only did made use of the attributes, and you know it was relatively smart about dealing with names. Uh, we also used this algorithm and applied transitive closure. We also did what we called a kind of naive relational uh, classifier. So I made the point that the relational um, information should be done jointly, so you should chain together these references. Well, at the same time, you could just throw in the co-authors as additional attributes, and that seems like information that's clearly useful. So are we really getting the benefit from the joint inference, or are we just getting the benefit from having extra attribute information? So we tried to test that by including um, something that just tossed those in as additional attributes. And then, you know, there's a huge amount of issues with actually evaluating entity resolution, but what I'm going to present are uh, pairwise decisions over the references and the F1 uh, measure of these. And um, if we look at these, uh, we see, you know, this focus on the relational clustering algorithm. We see that it certainly does outperform the baselines of the attributes either the ones using uh, transitive closure or not. And you see the effect here that sometimes transitive closure helps and sometimes it hurts you. We're also outperforming the naive one. And so, you know, that's interesting. And, um, you know, I won't get into the difference between these two algorithms, and I'm happy to talk about them offline, but both of them um, ended up being two different ways for doing uh, this relational clustering. But now, uh, it's kind of more interesting to look at this in, instead of the column-wise, or instead of the row-wise, the column-wise. And so if you instead look at sites here versus archive versus bio, the interesting thing is sites here, you know, we get some improvement, but it's not that much. So this is the computer science papers. Uh, for the physics one, you know, this actually is, you know, an important difference. But then for the bio-based one, we get a huge improvement. And so what is it about these data sets such that, okay, sites here, maybe I'm not even willing to pay the price to do the relational clustering uh, for the entity resolution, but bio-based, I definitely should be willing to do this. And if you think about it and actually look at the data sets, the structural characteristics, so the graph properties of these data sets are quite different. So first off, sites here is just not that ambiguous. It's a small data set. There aren't that many names that are that similar. And it's a computer science data set. The biobase, actually, this was a data set that was set up as a challenge. So what they did was they um, initialed all the first names. They focused on Asian names, and bio papers tend to have much longer author list. So that combination of effects, having much more ambiguous name references and much more kind of information content in the co-author information was enough to make this much more efficient or much more um, useful. 
So I think this element of understanding your domains and understanding how that structure um, is useful and then making a call, whether you're willing to do the more expensive inference algorithm or not is actually a really important message, not just for entity resolution, but for a lot of inference problems. Okay, so any questions here? Yeah, um, David. Sorry. So uh, these are uh, pairwise decisions over the references, and it's the F1 measure. So it's kind of combining these things. No. No. Uh, no worries. Okay. So, and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to do all the ident potential identification, Yeah, so this, we're setting it up as sort of an unsupervised setting, um, but it's interesting to think how supervision can come in in terms of setting the weights and so on. So I didn't emphasize this, but the results that I presented were over the best decision boundary for each of the algorithms separately, and so on. So, so I mean, if I can follow up on that, it, uh, so if I were trying to select the specific recall point, some kind of cutoff in the bear, I, you, you, then, I then you would. How you, I mean, so the one worry I would have is, is how do I can I sample from a network to create a, a, sort of a holdout set to do that? Do they have any thoughts on how I might be able to do that? Uh, so the question was, um, for these kinds of data sets, um, you know, what, what we presented was kind of unsupervised best performance overall um, cutoffs. So how would you go about choosing a holdout set and using that to validate? So two points to make. One of the things that we found is that actually, and this is consistent also with what Andrew McCallum has found, is that you actually need a very small amount of labeled data to set these. And so that's the upside. But the flip side of how you sample these data sets is a huge, huge, huge problem. And we don't have it so much in the context of entity resolution, but for some other problems, Looking at how people have done the sampling uh, for the network data, you get completely different results based on how you do these. And um, as far as I know, there's people that have called out the problem, but I haven't seen any great solutions. But if anybody has any pointers, definitely let me know. Um, OK, so uh, I do want to do the flip side which the flip side is privacy. So um, on the one hand, we have tons of observational data. We love to you know, align it together and do our resolution so that we can do the best um, uh, science that we can. On the other hand, um, all of the inference problems that I talked about actually map very well to different privacy concerns, and privacy concerns that have been studied in some cases in the literature and some that um, we've just started looking at. And so I want to go over these kind of at a high level, but basically entity resolution corresponds to identity disclosure. So if I can figure out who asked a query based on the query, I've um, disclose their identity. And then I'll go through these um, in the context of a well-known uh, online social uh, networking site, uh, which is Facebook. And so what I'm showing here is not a real profile. It's actually been munged together from uh, different pieces. And one of the things uh, that uh, we see here is that people have certain kinds of attributes. So the attributes include things like um, political uh, loyalties and uh, locations and so on. 
Uh, not surprisingly, you know, this is a social network, so we have to have our friends. So we have our friends over here. And then we have groups. So most of these uh, networking sites have the ability to join groups, and that's actually a big part of them. And so they, many sites allow you to um, control the, how much you make public. So one thing you can do is you can make your whole, pri your whole profile private. And then you don't see any attribute information. You don't see any friendship information. Or you can you know, not show your attribute information, but include your friends link. Um, on the other hand, it turns out that group affiliation is actually something that is usually not under your control. So that's under the control of the group owner. And so the many of the groups you can go to, you actually do see all of the members of the group. And there's not a way to um, uh, change that setting. And in the context of privacy, then we have the notion of identity disclosure, which occurs when an adversary is able to map a record to a specific individual. And, you know, obviously on Facebook, lots of times they want you to be able to map it to a specific individual, so it's not an issue. But in other cases, with query logs and so on, this might be an issue. Um, and the privacy literature has mostly focused on doing this based simply on structural characteristics. And the structural characteristics are really kind of uh, how identifiable are you based on your degree and so on. So it's not taking into account attribute information necessarily. Um, uh, another uh, type of disclosure is attribute disclosure. So figuring out the value of a uh, user's um, uh, attribute based possibly on you know, people that they're connected with. So maybe you can infer something about uh, political affiliation based on um, the c connections that are exposed in the network. Um, Corresponding to link prediction, there's a notion of when an adversary is able to figure out that there is a relationship between two people based on some other kind of information, in particular when that, that relationship might be sensitive. So figuring out, for example, um, the, the example that I've been using before, that uh, these two uh, queries were made by the same user, or maybe in a social network you're, you don't want to be able to infer that two people are friends, or you can infer that they're friends, but you'd rather not infer other relationships. Um, and then finally there's uh, the issue of being able to infer um, something about a user based on the groups or predict their group affiliations. Um, so typically, the way the anonymization process goes is people um, have some sort of network data. They have some sort of process that they go through and kind of change the data. And then they want to be able to say, whether or not they can guarantee that there's no privacy breaches and then you can make this public. And so obviously there's um, important issues like after you anonymize the data, is there any utility in the data left? Um, uh, one way to make sure there's no privacy breaches is to not release it at all. And I'm not going to get into a lot of details in this whole process. The key thing that I want to highlight is kind of in the context of graph identification, how to think about some of the privacy problems there. And um, first off, in a graph, there has been a lot of work on um, anonymizing nodes. And you can think of this as just 
you have a table describing a bunch of individuals. Uh, there's something called, for example, some of the early work, uh, K um, anonymity, uh, which goes by and basically takes records and hides attribute values such that then things that share the same values are all in an equivalence class. And basically, the idea is there have to be at least k members in each of these equivalence classes. So now, the question is, what if there's a graph? So what if there's links between these things? And uh, how do you anonymize the links? Well, um, you could just release them. You could do some kind of partial removal. So randomly remove you know, X percent of the edges. You could do something that kind of tries to combine together the uh, node anonymity methods by uh, doing something where you group together the nodes and now the edges no longer tell you what nodes in the cluster they connect. They just say they connect some node in a cluster with some node in another cluster. Or you can um, do other things like instead of keeping the counts of the edges, you can just say, OK, there was an edge, a friendship edge between someone here and someone here. You don't know how many there are. There was a works for a relationship and so on. So you keep the fact that there was a link. Or you can remove all of them. And it turns out, looking at these anonymization methods, even just to kind of understand what is the effect of having these links and what are the effect of these methods, um, you can see interesting things. So for example, these are synthetic data results where I'm varying the density. So how many links are going between things? And we see that for kind of um, sparse graphs, then basically the, the two cluster methods are actually um, doing a reasonable level. And then the interesting thing is as you kind of go up in complexity, then the, for example, the um, cluster, the constraint clustering does well. But the problem is you have to really think about how much information is actually being preserved by these things. So depending on what your um, analysis task is, the kind of utility of these things. and. One of the surprising things is that doing something like a random removal of edges, when the graph is highly connected, actually does about the same and obviously is a much easier thing to implement. So um, these are kind of preliminary results because of the fact that you know, people really haven't looked at anonymization in network data that much. Um, Another uh, issue that we looked at is how this group affiliation information affects the inference. And so this is, if I want to, for example, infer a attribute value, um, for example, political affiliation, knowing that someone belongs to you know, this social network is obviously giving a huge amount of information. And so I won't go over the, the different methods in detail that we compared, but basically let me try and give you a sense of what happens on uh, four online social network sites. So one is Flickr, the other is Facebook, the other is uh, 
uh, Dogster, which is actually an online pet work for dogs where you can specify your friends and uh, family, and um, Bibsonomy. Um, there were, basically we were trying to see how much does, um, even if you make your profile private, the fact that there's a fair amount of people that you link to, either through friends or through groups that don't make their profile private, how much can you infer about the attribute values? And we compared, I know I flashed through them, so I'm gonna try and give you like the high level bit and then anybody that wants to know more details about the algorithm. We essentially used one algorithm where we only used um, attribute information um, and kind of trivial in terms of just using, okay, what's the predominant class? So that's like a very basic um, baseline. The other class of methods made use of the friendship links. So using the friendship links, um, can I infer something like political affiliation based on the political affiliations of your friends? And then the kind of third class of methods we used were ones that made use of the group, inf group membership information. And the first thing to note is that actually, so this kind of set in here are ones that use just friendship information. And the surprising thing is friendship information actually wasn't that useful in these settings. Um, you know, it definitely was better than nothing, but um, clearly these were not um, very, many domains are very assortative, so it's, it's really easy to do this based on friendship information. However, using group information, which unfortunately is something that is usually public, um, you can do a very good job at inferring the attributes. And in fact, um, we, had one method that just used groups as basically a feature. But another method that was smarter about the selection of the groups, and it turns out that certain groups are very um, homogeneous. And so if you select out the groups that are very homogeneous and only use that, those, it does reduce your coverage. So that's not, but you can do extremely well. So. Here we get, like, in Flickr, what we were doing was we were inferring the country of origin of the user. And in Facebook, it was the political affiliation. And we're able to do quite well. And um, I'm, again, I'm not giving you all the details here, but um, this paper has, has more information. I'm happy to chat with people afterwards. Um, so what's the connection? So we have this notion of, okay, inference allows us to do graph identification. If I can't do identification, then I'm, you know, uh, able to guarantee privacy. So uh, the good thing I tell my students about working in this area is, you know, you can publish either way if you have the positive result or the negative result. Um, and so just to kind of show my group, uh, Elena uh, here is the one that's doing most of the work on privacy, and Galileo here is uh, the one that's doing much of the work in graph identification. And actually this is them after they uh, took me out to lunch uh, for, uh, to celebrate me getting tenure. You can kind of tell by the relieved look on their faces. Um, and so, in conclusion, we have this, the graph structure and the attributes matter, so making use of both the graph information and 
the content information is important. There's a lot of killer apps, and the one that I wanted to point out at the bottom in search, I think there's some interesting things with abstracting click and query graphs. And while there's important pitfalls, um, there's also a lot of benefits and payoffs. So, thanks. So that's interesting. So one of the things that happens in social network data is sometimes the relationships are directional. And so A can be the friend of B, but B doesn't have to be the friend of A, versus other times they're symmetric and either they're kind of enforced to be symmetric. There's something about the um, tool that enforces that versus not. Um, that's definitely a very interesting question. Um, I would imagine that if you looked into the data sets that you would see effects of that, especially if it's from the user interface that was kind of forcing that. Um, um, but it's something that we haven't really studied. Um, I didn't go into the details of how we did the, some of the group inference. And one of the ways, uh, simple ways of doing it is basically take everybody in a group and say they're friends. So make the, that an explicit click and then feed it into your algorithm. So um, th there's a lot of kind of interesting issues with how you do that representation. And uh, they can not only have important um, result in artifacts in the data, um, but they also can have a huge impact on um, computational efficiency, too, if you're naive about how you do that. So certainly, a social scientist, uh, a sociologist would be very interested in, you know, you should, whether or not in the design, you have it directed, and, you know, they'll look at how many non-reciprocated relationships there are, and so on, so. MySpace is a globally connected set, so everyone's a common friend, so your customers will blow up their message special case stuff like that. Right? I didn't quite catch up. So MySpace is a globally connected set, everyone's a common friend, whereas the you know, other sets are, are, are disjoint. So you will come to characters of the individual network as well. Yeah, so the point was that you know some networks, MySpace, are kind of globally connected versus some others, you're more likely to have kind of different islands in them, and that can have an uh, impact on uh, computational efficiency. Any other questions? Yeah. There was one more question. Yes, uh, so the question was about the robustness of the entity resolution algorithm. And so we looked at robustness in two senses. So one is just the algorithm that I actually sort of presented is just a greedy agglomerate of clustering algorithm. So how sensitive is it to that, the fact that it's a, a myopic kind of algorithm? And it turns out at least what we found is it was much less sensitive to that than we uh, had expected. So it was actually surprisingly robust. But then the other question that you ask is, OK, well, how robust is it to actually the removal of links and so on? And that's actually something we're very much working on right now. <laughs> Any other questions? So actually characterizing how important the edge attributes are versus the 
um, attributes of the reference are is very important. And that's something that we um, did look at in the case of trying to do online entity resolution. So we have some work where instead of viewing entity resolution as this, you know, I'm going to do this offline process, clean my database, and so on, it's more of an IR perspective of, OK, you know, I have this reference. How do I pull in enough information to then disambiguate the reference? And for that, we were looking at different properties of how ambiguous the attributes are, how ambiguous the links are, and trying to kind of uh, have an adaptive method that would take those into account. So um, make use of the links that are most likely to reduce the ambiguity. Thank you.